Amazon Go closures, Chef's nationwide expansion, and Olo's restaurant of the future. That's all ahead on this week's Digital Restaurant. The Digital Restaurant works like this. We're gonna ask each other five questions about headlines that have caught our attention from the worlds of off-premise, restaurants, and technology, but in some way tie back to our book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant. Are you ready? Let's go. Hi, Carl. How are you doing this week? I'm doing well. Thank you, Meredith. Where in the world are you? Wonderful. This week, of course, I'm in Wyoming on a ranch, as you would be. I'd like to give a little shout out to the Brush Creek Ranch. It is beautiful here. And they take this whole farm to table thing truly to the next level and are fantastic at restaurant and hospitality operators. So nice job. All right. First question this week for you, Carl, is BurgerFi teaming up with Flyby. Tell us about it. Yeah, last time we had swipe by, this time we're talking about flyby. But BurgerFi, as you know, Meredith, are one of the most tech forward thinking restaurant companies out there. I, I really love their kind of innovation first spirit and their ability to always be at the forefront of technology enhancements for the for the industry. And this latest announcement is about their partnership with Radius Networks and their flyby pickup products. So what is this? Well, it's largely around proximity triggered notifications which enables both customers and delivery drivers when they are nearby to the restaurant or at a point of interest to receive a notification. And that's particularly helpful because it can enable things like more precise fire times so that orders are coming off the line at the right time or around the same time when the person arriving enters the restaurant. So it's it's very much like, you know, similar to what you guys are offering at Empowered Delivery, if you will. I also like the fact that it helps the kitchen team right? Because the kitchen team are also getting audible visual alerts and they can obviously deploy their, their order preparation through something called FAFA Topham, which is an acronym. It means first, <laughs> it means first arrived, first I mean, out. Bless you. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> the dashboard that they have also reveals important customization requests. And we know that we're always talking about things like accuracy complaints. And so this uh, notification system, both to the team at the, in the back of house, helps them see those bits of information as well. But one of the features I particularly like is where the functionality identifies if the customer has gone to the wrong location. Now, burger fires are sometimes located in areas where there are several burger fires in one geographic kind of area, if you will. And so if the customer starts heading into the wrong direction to pick up from a different spot, then they'll actually receive a notification to say, oh, you're going in the wrong direction, head to this particular spot. So that one I haven't heard about before. And I, I like no, that. does that happen? Wow. That's, you know, I guess if you've got locations close to each other, it, it might do. Flyby also allows the, the text notification service to be used to drive foot traffic and loyalty redemption to the restaurant. So imagine you're walking in a mall thinking about what you're wanting for lunch. And because you and your phone are close by to a burger fly, you're going to get a text alert saying that you can use X points for a free frozen custard dessert. And then, of course, you're more likely to convert that customer who is perhaps still assessing their options. And that's pretty smart. It shows how these kind of proximity trigger notifications can be used to their, their fullest potential. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to question two. Amazon are shutting some of these Amazon Go locations, eight locations, I believe. I've been to one of these. I don't know whether you have. I'm always very impressed by them. What do you think is behind the reason as to why they're closing down a few of them? They have publicly stated that they are closing eight of them. That will take them from 31 to 23 locations. They have said they remain committed to it. We'll keep opening it. And they're just closing some of the underperforming stores in the fleet. However, eight out of 31 is quite a few underperforming stores in a fleet, as, as you and I both know, for managing large networks. That's also coming at the same time that they're pausing their fresh expansion. And so it makes me wonder what's actually happening here. I think a very responsible company to take a pause and think about how do we do this best, clearly, not in a rush to get something out there just for the sake of getting it out there. However, Amazon is a finely tuned engine and it is finely tuned for e-commerce. So I think that what they're finding is physical retail is very different from e-commerce 
and trying to be omni-channel is harder than it looks. Same thing the restaurants are finding out, right? Trying to serve all occasions out of the same footprint is a very tricky thing to do. And I think this is why we at Empowered Delivery, and I think you and I both, Carl, would say that purpose-built for single channels in many ways is much more efficient and much easier for specific occasions. But you compare that to the fact that the guest is omni-channel and expects to be able to interact with the brand the, any way they want, any time they want. It, it becomes a very tricky situation, I think, both for grocery retailers and for restaurants to navigate. And of course, my favorite saying here was Katie Young at Starbucks, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago saying that all stores don't have to be all things to all people. So I, I think this shows that even the mightiest Amazon is struggling with this. How do I serve people in the different ways I want to be served when I am finely tuned to do one specific thing? Okay, question three. So Noodles & Co, they've got digital menu boards going up and they want to use them for dynamic pricing. Carl, this one must be near and dear to your heart. I'm super excited I get to answer this one. I don't get to talk about dynamic pricing enough. Of course, that's a joke if you follow me on LinkedIn. I'm always talking about it. But this one caught my eye because this is one of the first big chains that we've seen talking about both dynamic pricing through digital menu boards. In their annual result call, the CEO announced their intent to spend $10 million on digital menu boards across their 368 company-owned locations. And that's obviously an investment in digitization for the on-premise occasion. And they see the, the flexibility of pushing certain messages out at different times, such as gift cards at, during the holidays or changes to featured menu items. I suspect it could also be used for when things are perhaps running low in stock and so therefore don't feature certain items on the menu that they can't produce and create that level of disappointment. You know, the, uh, the thing about dynamic pricing is their CFO, Carl Lukacs, said it's absolutely part of the strategy. Obviously, at Juicer, we've been largely helping restaurants with off-prem dynamic pricing. So largely to focus on the agnostic customer that's already willing to pay for convenience. So to see a brand of this size try something in the on-premise space is particularly interesting. You know, 75% of their orders are conducted in store, even if they're consumed away from the store, that's still quite a large proportion of customers that are in the building when they're actually ordering. One of the other things that I noted here, which I think is particularly compelling about pricing capabilities as we go forward into this space, is around cost of product management. The article pointed to some other items around the results, and they said chicken prices, which represent about 12% of their cost of goods, have come down over the last year, but prices for many key ingredients have been locked down for the remainder of the year. I think a huge surprise that a lot of the big chains will look to lock down prices and hedge their bets, if you will. But I wonder how suppliers out there, the ones like US Food, Cisco, Cargill, and the like, would like better capability to drive cost fluctuations into the restaurant, knowing now that the end price can be addressed immediately without the restaurant having to accommodate that margin shortfall. So in many ways, this will be probably one of the big value adds for suppliers in enabling better dynamic pricing capability for the industry in the years ahead. So it's an interesting one and I'm looking forward to seeing how Noodles and Company get on with both the digital menu board strategy and dynamic pricing. Okay, fourth question this week. Olo had their internal conference, which I believe is called Beyond Beyond 4, I think. But they also shared a video of a certain Noah Glass talking about his vision for the restaurant of the future. You've checked this out. What do you think? First of all, it's a wonderful video. Nice job, Olo. And I think we'll put it in the links so that people can check it out themselves if they want to. It is notable to me that although the video was made for restaurants, Noah is speaking to consumers the entire time. And he's highlighting how the consumer experience can be better using technology. And he highlights it in all the different modes, right? So dine-in restaurant, carry out, ordering at home, drive every single place. He talks about the ways in which technology can make that experience better, which is very cool for the consumer. And remember restaurants, we never do technology for technology's sake. We do it to make a better consumer experience, a better employee experience, to lower costs, to make things faster, those kinds of things. We don't just put it in. So it's very notable that he chose the consumer as the audience whose experience he wants to make better. I think it speaks a lot to Olo's general strategy to be omni-channel, 
what I will call consumer facing, right? So he, he doesn't talk in the video about how the employees' lives will be better or how the above restaurant life will be better. He's really speaking to that consumer audience and all of the ways in which the Olo technology makes that individual experience better, but then how it's able to stitch together for restaurants that use all their different products, stitch together all that data to make Mer's experience excellent, no matter which mode they choose to interact with the brand. So very, very interesting video. Check it out. Last question. We've got another new funding, which of course we always love to hear about. And Chef is the name of the company. And since they got their investment, they're planning a national deployment. Tell us about that. Yeah, this is this is an exciting one. They've raised seventy three and a half million dollars, so it's not a small raise, right? It's pretty huge, and so uh, no, no no surprise for nationwide expansion here. For those of you that don't know who Chef are, they are a platform that provides home cooked meals across eleven states and, and Washington D.C. And on Wednesday last week, have now enabled cooks to apply to sell meals on their platform no matter where they are in the country. As I say, they raised 73 and a half million and that's gonna enable this nationwide expansion push. And they're saying they're also gonna use some of that investment to try and create more of a personalized experience for its consumers. Now, let me show you the screen for a second, Meredith. That is Chef's front screen for me right here in my zip code. Remind you of anything? Well, the pictures across the top look exactly like DoorDash, don't they? Remind me of exactly that. It looks a lot like DoorDash. So it goes to show that there is something here around having a marketplace, but it's a marketplace with a difference. Now, let's talk a little bit about regulations because this has occurred because many states have now enabled regulations that allow the sale of certain types of homemade meals. We talked about this last year, if you recall, Meredith, I think it was California that enabled it. But instead of cooks having to rent expensive commercial kitchen space, maybe in ghost kitchens, for example, entrepreneurial chefs can use their home kitchen as their incubator for all intents and purposes. So so what, what are some of these regulations? Well, in 25 states, there are a variety of revenue caps in place. For example, if you're in Virginia, you can't sell any more than $3,000 a year in selling pickled foods. However, if you're in Florida or Wyoming, you can sell up to $250,000. In uh, 19 other states, food producers are limited to selling from a specific set list of products approved by the regulators. So Vermont and where you're from, Wisconsin, for instance, can sell baked goods but not candy. So chocolate chips. Oh my goodness. Well, this is chocolate. a hot mess. <laughs> exactly. um, but perhaps a little bit more concerning, only six states mandate extensive inspections and licensing requirements. And so, you know, that I think is an interesting one. So the chef interface is great because it feels like it's on DoorDash. But the thing you probably didn't see on the screen there is how different the foods are on chef's home screen versus DoorDash. It plays exactly into the niche food messaging from chapter two of our love it. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of Indian food. And I tell you, there are so many great, beautiful photography, I'm sure very well tasting dishes available through through what Chef have here. So there's this different ethnic, exotic types of foods and definitely not mainstream. So I haven't used their service yet, perhaps with a bit more stronger messaging on food safety inspections. I can see this really taking off and evidence to why the chef team were able to get such a large investment. That's very cool. And there's also a cool company named Cast Iron that does back office management for exactly businesses like these. And I think that goes to show you that there's a lot of home-based businesses, food businesses that are ready to grow. I mean, you think of the enormous growth we had in home-based businesses as e-commerce took off on the backs of Etsy and Shopify and things like that. We're now starting to see something similar in food. And we love, as you mentioned with chapter two, we love the increased diversity and food options that that brings to those of us here in America who maybe don't get to try the excellent curries that you have over in London, Carl. That's right. Well, look, we're going to do something a little different still because we've gone through our five questions, but we've got some mm-hmm. exciting news. I'm going to bring this up here quickly. We have our new book coming out, Meredith, tomorrow, tomorrow. And so we're talking live on LinkedIn, our nation's restaurant news with editor-in-chief Sam Ochez at 1 p.m. Pacific. And so we're going to be talking about the book, why we wrote it, exactly how we think it's going to help those that read it. But if you can't make that session, 
Uh, we've recorded a special little launch video a few weeks back when my hair was a little shorter. And if you'd like to tune into that, then that's coming up straight after. So lots more to come on the book, more great content here on the Digital Restaurant Podcast in the weeks and months to come. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, you can use the QR code to head to the digital.restaurant website and you can buy a copy. Or if you'd like, you can get both editions of the book for a special price of $30. But if you like those marketplaces, it is available on Amazon as well, on Kindle. Yeah. And probably in about a month or so, we're going to get an a audible version. So if you'd like mm -hmm. to listen to it in the car, you'll be able to get that version too. Let's listen to what we recorded a few weeks ago and give people a, a bit more information about why we wrote this. Good morning, Meredith. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How about you, Carl? I am excited. I'm excited because we have some exciting news to share with everyone. Ooh, do you want to do the big no, reveal or do you want me? All right, I'll do it. I'll do it. Why not? We are super excited because finally we can tell everyone that our book is available. Our second book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant Path to Digital Maturity. Do you want to take a look? Let's bring it up. Let's have a look. Here it is, Meredith. What do you oh, think? It's a nice looking book. Here's a bit more presence on screen. There we go. I like um, it. So I'm excited because this feels like it's a necessary add-on to the original. Maybe I could start today by asking you, why do you think it's a necessary add-on? And why did we get into this? Because we started, if I may remind you, we started with the idea of just writing a bonus chapter, do you remember? And then it started to get into something more. And then we ended up saying, this isn't really a pamphlet. So where should we take this? And then we said, well, actually, let's do this properly. Okay book. Yep. And, and here we are. Why did we do this, Meredith? Well, first of all, I have to say thank you to everyone for the reception of the first book. We for sure would not write a second book if we were not motivated by all the positive feedback from everyone on the first book. And so thank you for buying it. Thank you for recommending it to friends. Thank you for passing along your used copy to someone else you think needs to read it. And thank you for all the reviews on Amazon that help other people, strangers, find the book. That's really gratifying. And I think especially for an author, the most amazing thing is when someone you don't know contacts you and says, I really got a lot out of this. Just a wonderful thing. And that is all fantastic. But of course, the number one piece of feedback that we get is, hey, this book is great about telling me why this is happening, what exactly is happening, who's leading the charge. But I need more on what specifically I and my restaurant should be doing about it. And over the last 18 months since the book came out, Carl, you and I have been doing a lot of public speaking. And a lot of what we've been talking about is these much more specific action steps that restaurants should be taking in this new digital world. We reached the conclusion that there was a lot of really good content here that probably needed to be shared more broadly than just whoever happened to be in the room or on the webinar that we were talking with. And we started writing the bonus chapter. The bonus chapter became three Three bonus chapters became a booklet. A booklet became a book. And next thing here we are. I hope that everyone finds it just a really helpful, action-oriented companion book to the first one. Yeah, I agree. It is very much a playbook of sorts. The tonality is definitely different. I think you'd say perhaps the first one was very business orientated in the sense that we really delved into the depths of why all this was happening. And the how, as you talk about it there, I think, Meredith, is important because what we try to do here is almost demonstrate a linear path that restaurants should think of what's happening in the industry right now. That's why the subtitle there, The Path to Digital Maturity, is so important because we lay out specific steps. And in many ways, the chapters and the outline of the chapters follow those steps along. And everyone will have a different journey for sure. It's not suggesting that, that there's only one particular way to reach digital maturity. Mm -hmm. The whole intent here is to help restaurants find their place and then focus on becoming pretty decent in that particular area before perhaps progressing on. And I think it's really important right now because restaurateurs are thinking, where do I put my investment money? Where do I think I should focus my time and my energy and learn where I need to learn before moving on to the next step on that pathway? Mm -hmm. So maybe it will be helpful for us to uh, perhaps give a bit of a highlight on what the path looks like. Do you want to give us where the path starts on this one? Yeah, absolutely. So it opens with those third parties, which I think are the easiest way to get online and be found. And we broadly define third parties to include not just the marketplaces, but also Google search engine, where now you have things like Google order when your restaurant pops up. 
We talk a lot about these because although restaurants, I think, have had a bit of a love-hate relationship with these third-party marketplaces, they are incredibly important to making your brand known to hungry consumers. And so we talk in this first chapter about how specifically restaurants should optimize their presence on these third-party platforms and really drive sales. We then move over to the importance of first-party ordering channels and the all-important topic of getting consumers to order direct. I would say first-party conversion is one of the most frequently asked questions that we've received this last year. Don't you think, Carl? I think it's the thing that will probably be most valued from maybe the entire book. So it's an important chapter. Yeah, this chapter, we talk about how do you think about creating a great first-party experience? What are the elements of a great first party experience, because we constantly say, Carl, don't we, that no amount of discounting will overcome a lot of friction. And so we spend a lot of time talking about how do you eliminate that friction in your first party experience? And then once you have, what are some of the things you can do to get consumers to know that you have one and to use it instead of the third parties? Now, caveat, just because you tell them and you have a great experience doesn't mean they're going to move over. Some people are always going to use the third parties. Some people get subsidized by their employers. Some people have a dash pass and they are always going to use them. And that is part of the reason why you have to embrace them and figure out how to play nicely with them and take advantage of the great service they offer, which is a way to find hungry consumers. And then from that, we then say that's not the end of the story, because when you can start generating extra volume through your third party and your first party channel, you've got to then start to understand more about the ability for you to keep those channels open and optimize your operation. Because in a way, the digital side of the business isn't in isolation from the rest of the business. I think most restaurateurs over the last couple of years have found it increasingly difficult to be able to say, well, how do I combine all of these things together? In fact, uh, in the original book, Meredith, that's why we talked about drive through When drive through took 10 plus years to proliferate into the US restaurant industry, it did so because it had such an impact also to the standard operations of the restaurant business model. And what we're advocating for here is to say our operation is getting increasingly complex because of the delivery, because of takeout, because of the off-premise channel. And so for that reason, you also need to think about how you operate your business as well. And so we delve into the depths of capacity management, how to truly understand the utilization of your kitchen. What are some of the tips that you can learn from the experts in this space to really optimize the throughput capacity that you have? And then from that, once I've identified that capacity and how much capacity I have, what other ways can I grow my business? Then we get into detail on growing your business with virtual brands and ghost kitchens. The first book talked about these as ideas that would come very futury. What has happened in the last few years is that they have become ideas that are. These are choices that restaurateurs are facing every day. Should I go into a ghost kitchen? Should I add a virtual brand to my existing restaurant? Should I make my brand into a virtual brand? Restaurants are facing these questions every single day, and it can be a bit confusing to sort through all the various options that restaurants have. So we dive deep into those options and talk about how a restaurant should decide which path to choose. And the path is not yet finished. We then go into the angle of the importance of data. Because by now, if you're at this particular juncture on the path, then you've actually got a huge amount of data within your business. And how you utilize that data, both in terms of for your operation, but perhaps more personally for your guests, and how you're using that data to formulate a true digital restaurant experience, no matter which channel they engage with you. And I think this is an area which is going to be particularly exciting over the years ahead, because it's really an area where it's still very nascent. There's a lot of technology companies that are really starting to dedicate a lot of time and resource into this. And I think restaurants are going to really be able to stand to benefit from it. That's exactly right. There is so much still to happen. We love now Glass's phrase, the digital entirety, when restaurants take digital orders regardless of channel. And that is going to spit off so much data. And there's going to be so many interesting things that we can do with that. But we're very much at the front end of it today. So the question is, for your restaurant, what do you need? What should you be putting in? And how should you be using that information? Where does it go beyond that? Then we get into the true future stuff, which is about 
what the future business model of a restaurant even looks like, where your restaurant might fit into that, how you disrupt your own restaurant to become truly that future model. And then ending the book with a little chat with our friends at the technology companies. Absolutely. This term that we use is holistic technology in this particular area. And it's a call out to the technologist to say, you have a role in this as well, because for restaurateurs truly to reach the zenith of digital maturity, the technology needs to continue to evolve, not just in terms of the functionality, but in the way in which it speaks to itself and other parts of the technology ecosystem. And the better the technology can talk to different parts of the overall system, the better the restaurant will function, and ultimately the better the customer experience will be. And that, we think, is really a great point to finish at least the path at this stage of where we think the digital restaurant needs to reach. So we think there's going to be a lot of value here for restaurants, no matter where they are on the digital maturity pathway. And we think there's going to be a lot of value there for the technologists that are building the solutions for restaurants. We hope that those of you that have enjoyed the first book will see how complimentary the second book is. We're looking forward to hearing from everyone and seeing exactly what you think. Within each of the chapters, there are a whole range of different tips. There are interviews again with some of the leaders in our space, some from the first book and new folks that we didn't get around to speak to the first time. And then also worksheets, worksheets that are going to be downloadable through our website, which will allow folks to really ask themselves the questions. So to dig deep inside to say, what do I need to really assess whether I am at this particular stage or not? Meredith, how do people get the book? Little shout out for my dog there in the background. He oh, loves maybe. the book. He's going to be our key marketing force. I, I, I think so. Nobody can resist a Shiba. It's true, especially on the internet. Getting the book, pretty easy. There are, of course, two ways. There is the marketplace way, little marketplace known as Amazon. And the book is now available for order on Amazon. So you can head there, look up Delivering the Digital Restaurant. The two books will come up. That blue one is the first one. And the one over here that you see that's more white and green is the second one called The Path to Digital Maturity. If you want to support the first party channel, you can do that, can't you, Carl? How do you do that? <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad you reminded me about the first party channel. Of course, our own website, deliveringthedigitalrestaurant.com, is available for you to go to get a special combo deal. So if you're one of those folks that have yet to get your own copy of the first book, Delivering the Digital Restaurants, Your Roadmap to the Future of Food, and you like the idea of getting this new book, then you can get the two together for a special combo price. So head to deliveringthedigitalrestaurant.com and you'll be able to get both books sent to you, signed by both Meredith and I. I know we're going to put a lot of content out there talking about the new book. I'm excited to do some more publicity with you on this, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest. Again, we're really appreciative of each of you to help us spread the word. We'd love to see some more selfies out there with your copy of the book. Tell us what you think of the book. I'm sure you'll say we've missed a few things out. And if that's the case, then I'll get to work and try and convince Meredith to write a third book a year down. Ah. Don't count your chickens on that one. Hopefully we've done it right this time around. <laughs> Meredith, thank you as ever. Looking forward to getting started with this book release. And if you want to go to Amazon or to deliver in the digital restaurant and get your copy, then you can do that right now. The Digital Restaurant Podcast is available for you to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Watch us, rate us, and subscribe to The Digital Restaurant on YouTube and follow along on all our social media digital restaurant channels. Thanks for listening.